things, but from time to time, I would go over there to see my buddy and she would talk to me. And she would tell me how, yeah, you know, we got a vacation home somewhere, and I forget where it was. And I'm like, my goodness. I didn't know these things were really, really possible. I was being introduced to just a different way that people live. And me and Smiley began to talk, and he kind of got into some, some bad stuff against the law. And he was using some drugs, and somebody put something in it. And he was never the same again. Even to this day, I went to visit him some years ago. He is a schizophrenic now. Never going to be able to work another day in his life. He's younger than me. And he's got to get on disability. And he's in, he was in some kind of federal facility because he got in trouble with the law. And even after that, he's going to be confined to certain types of hospitals. He won't be able to live with a, a normal life again. Now, the reason I say that is because if you were to see him walk in the street, many people might look down on somebody like that. And I think all of us ought to be able to say, if it hadn't been for the grace of God, that would be me, that would be you. I, I, I go into my office and, and across the street every morning, and it's been cold mornings. There's a person sleeping on the steps of an abandoned building, wrapped up in all kinds of blankets and bags and stuff. And if it had not been for the grace of God, that would be you and me. I mean, if we just honest. Most of us, one missed payment away from having something taken away anyway. And so my point behind this is that we need to thank God for his grace. Thank him for being merciful. Thank him for being kind to us. And when we come to church, let's give God our full attention. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 10, 11, and 12. Matthew 5. Verse 10, 11, and 12. I'm going to read these verses. This is Jesus. Verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you or you are blessed. Blessed when? When, when, when I get a new house or new clothes, a big sum of money. Well, that can be a blessing, but you're also blessed when men shall revile you. You're also blessed when they persecute you. You're just as blessed. Now, here comes the clincher. I can stay on this one all day. When they say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Instead of complaining, Instead of taking you some melatonin and going to bed, mm -hmm. you need to rejoice Amen. and be exceeding or exceedingly glad. For great is your reward, not on earth. Some stuff you got to wait for, but in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, the other righteous people, which are which were before you. Amen. You may be seated. We could say better days are coming, but for some of us going through this, you can say better days are here. Right. Amen, somebody. Amen. Jesus 
is on the outside. The early verses of chapter 5 teach us that. And seeing the multitudes, verse 1, he went up into a mountain. And when he was sent, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. And beginning at verse 3, you have a whole bunch of red writing. Because this is the sermon notes about saying. In verse 1, when it says, seeing the multitudes, yes. that word seeing doesn't mean just an exterior sight. Yes. He could see who was tall and who was short, what color clothing people had on. It's, it's deeper than that. Not just sight, but he had insight. What it's trying to display to us, Matthew is saying, is that Jesus was able to see their spiritual condition. Yes. Jesus was aware of what was on their hearts. Jesus was aware of what they were dealing with. He was aware of their good. He was aware of their bad. His eyes, as it were, are in every place. Beholding the evil and the good that men do. Yes. It says he saw, verse 1, the multitudes. Then it goes down and it says, when he sat down, his disciples came unto him. Yes. The multitude and the disciples are the same group of individuals. <laughs> the disciples is not just left to the twelve. But it's using the word disciples in a broader context, meaning anyone that was a personal follower of his. Yeah. Jesus now is about to preach to a group of individuals, a whole lot of people. Jesus is about to preach to his learners, his followers. Verse 1 even calls it this multitude. Now, lest we get the wrong understanding of the ministry of Jesus, people seem to gauge the success or lack of success by how many people you got that show up when you preach God's word. Jesus here had a multitude. But when you read John chapter 6, he started with the multitude. But as he began to preach God's word, the multitude began to dwindle down. He started with 5,000 men, not including women and children, gave everybody a two-piece fish dinner. Boy, they came from miles around. But when he began talking about the Bible, when he began giving them his requirements, they recognized he was not just going to be their burger king, he was going to be their spiritual king. They began to leave, and Jesus got so low, he looked at his disciples and said, are y'all going to leave me too? You see, you cannot gauge the success of or lack thereof based on how many people show up. Let me tell you something right now. You can get a crowd that can form around a wreck on the freeway. That doesn't mean anything significant is taking place. Yeah. Jesus, he has a multitude. And then it says, when he was set, not meaning when he was ready, that means when he sat down. All right. You see, the rabbis, when they would teach, they would stand and they would read from a scroll if they had one, but then they would sit down and they would begin to teach and give what God's word says. Right. You see, this speaks of authority. This speaks of the master teacher. This speaks of Jesus about to sit down authoritatively and give God's word to God's people. And I don't know about you, but these are a privileged people. You see, you can line up whoever you think your favorite preacher is from A to Z, from one side of the coast to the other. But their preaching pales in comparison to the preaching of Jesus the Christ. He opened his mouth and he began to teach them. He's teaching them 
on the side of a mountain. And that's really sad when you think about it. The enemies of Christ, they sit in what Matthew 23 called, they sit in Moses' seat inside of the temple, inside of the synagogue. They, they sit in these nice accommodations. But the king of kings and the Lord of Lord is forced to have to go outside on a mountain to teach God's people. One commentary writer says it this way, it's fitting that he chose an elevated place to teach because he's about to give them some elevated principles. So what did he say to them in verse number three? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does it mean, blessed are the poor in spirit? Blessed are the ones who know and recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt. And the only one that can help them is God, and they come to the Lord for help. You see, God is the only one that can spiritually enrich you. God is the only one that can mature and grow you. God is the only one that can take you from being a babe in Christ to being fully grown and a mature Christian. It's akin to what the Hebrew writer said when he said, y'all should be teaching others by now, but you haven't grown enough. Somebody still has to teach you. And here Jesus is saying, you are blessed when you recognize that you don't have it all together. You are blessed when you recognize that there's still room for me to grow. You are blessed when you recognize that although I'm not what I used to be, I don't do what I used to do. I still have a ways to go on this Christian journey. So he says, blessed are those that are poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, verse 4, are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. But what, what, what does he mean, mourn? He's not talking about grief or mourning because somebody you love has gone on to glory. He's not talking about mourning or sadness because you lost the job or because you had a bad set of circumstances. No, no, no. He said you are blessed when you grieve and you mourn over the spiritual mistakes that you make. You see, you should be broken over your sin. Broken because of your sin. This is different than people that do wrong and know it's wrong, but still dig in their heels and glorify what is wrong. That's the opposite of what this verse is talking about. He said you're blessed when you mourn. You are blessed when you have a godly sorrow over your sin. He said these things are a blessing. Blessed are they that mourn because there's somebody that can come along and comfort you. You see, God has not taken away as Christians. God has not taken away our ability to sin. You can read the Bible and see that. There's tons of men and women that were devout followers of the Lord, but they still did wrong on purpose. God has not taken away our ability to sin, but he has taken away our ability to sin and like it like we used to. If you can still wallow in the mock and mire of sin and it don't bother you, there's no remorse, there's no grief, there's something spiritually wrong with an individual like that. Because sooner or later, there's a person called the Holy Spirit. And what he does is he's a convictor of our sins. And here Jesus is saying, when that happens and you know you've done wrong and you know you haven't said it right and you know you didn't do it right and you're broken and grieving over the mistakes that you have made yourself. He said, you're blessed. And somebody here can testify with me, can't you see things clearer? When your eyes have been washed with tears over your own mistakes sometimes. Sometimes you can look back over your life. You, 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 you knew it was wrong. Mama told you it was wrong. Daddy said don't do it. But you pushed on anyway. And then when everything fell to pieces. Listen, sometimes it causes tears to come into, into your eyes. And the truth is, sometimes the only person you can blame is yourself. 
Jesus said, you're blessed when you mourn because they shall be comforted. Blessed, verse 5, are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the humble. When it says meek, blessed are the patient, the, the long suffering. Blessed are those that are lowly. The ones that can hold up under pressure for a long time. He said, blessed are the meek. Well, well, how is it that you can remain lowly and patient and pliant? How can you remain in this state? You have to surrender to the will of God. Let me tell you something right now. The flesh has not forgotten how to get somebody out their face. Talk back to me if you can. The flesh remembers all those old tricks you used to use. And the flesh is always in the passenger seat, just nodding to you. If you don't want to handle it the right way, I'm ready, willing, and able to drive this car like we used to drive this car. The only way that you can remain in that state is to surrender and yield to the word of God. But let me say this to you. If you ever tried this, you know this is hard. Talk back to me if you can. If you ever try to be patient with somebody that's impatient. Let me fix it up. Y'all ain't helping me this morning. If you ever try to hold your tongue to somebody who's talking crazy to you. Let me fix it one more time. If you ever went to a restaurant or you ever went to a cashier desk and that little person slides your money and throw your money and throw your car to an 18-year-old self with lashes as big as a box fan and you got to try to hold your tongue and be patient. If you ever tried this, y'all ain't gonna help me this morning. I'm gonna tell the truth though. You know how difficult this can be. I went to Walmart one year on Bowman. I'm gonna call them out. I just wanted to get a key made. A dollar, two dollars. All I saw was the blue vest coming toward me and say, how can I help you on that? The little girl walked by me as I'm talking, she just walked school by me. Now I'm already upset. I'm like, oh, okay, let, let it go, let it go. I go to the little key counter and guess who the person is that make the keys? The little young girl that walked by me. So I said, ma'am, I'm just here to get a key made. I laid it down, she took that key and snatched it, I'm gonna make a scratch on the counter. I'm like, all right, now, 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 we, we about to have some problem. And I said, well, everything all right? Lord, when I say that's fine. She gets to talking and raise her voice. I don't feel like being here. I'm like, hey, hey, I ain't got nothing to do with that. What you say to me? That's what she said to me now. I said, oh, no, hey, hey, look, girl, get my key back. I'm going to go before I hurt somebody. Then she go call the manager. Here we go. It's for the blow up now. It's for the blow up now. And it was, let me say it this way it's hard to be humble when you've been done wrong. It's hard to be meek and lonely and calm and pliant. It's hard to do these things and you ain't done nothing to start. It's hard to hold your tongue when the pressure is on you and it's not of your starting. So when Jesus said, Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. He said, listen, it's a blessing when you do it my way. Because how many times have we done it the other way and things fail by the wayside? Blessed are the meek, verse number six. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. He said, because if that's your desire, you shall be filled. He talks about thirsting for righteousness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. He says it in a way as if to create the imagery of somebody who's exasperated. When he says hunger and when he says thirst, it doesn't mean like I had my breakfast, I missed my lunch, so I'm going to get home and get some food before I go run my errands. I'm kind of hungry. It uses the imagery of somebody who's at the point of death. Somebody who's at the point of starvation. Somebody who's been in a desert climate is hot and humid. Just a drop of water is all you would love to have. Not somebody who just missed a couple glasses of water, but somebody who is exasperated and they're so ready to eat, so hungry, so thirsty. He said, when you have that type of mindset and wanting to get closer to me, when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, he said, well, I can prepare a meal for you. All right. 
that speaks to the desire that he would love for us to have as it relates to learning his word, to getting closer to him. It should be like a person that is starving, hasn't had food in days. They're at the point of passing out. And when you give them a piece of food, they're not going to say, I don't like wheat bread or I like the bread with the edges taken off. I only like saltine crackers. I don't like rich crackers. No, you can give them a piece of food. They're going to love it. Why? Because they're hungry and thirsty to the point where they're about to pass out. That's the desire that he says we're supposed to express as we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Our desire to get closer to him ought to surpass your desire for your favorite sports team. Our desire to get closer to him ought to surpass your desire to see the latest movie of the day. Our desire to get closer to him is to surpass anything or anyone we should hunger and thirst after righteousness. And he says, and if you do that, you will get what you want. You will be filled. Blessed, verse 7, are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Merciful is not just an attitude of heart. Merciful is action as well. Yeah. It's not just feeling pitiful or remorseful or sorry for someone that's going through a tough state and going a little easy on them. Merciful is the way that you feel it and guess what? You do what you can within your means to give them relief. He says, blessed are the merciful because guess what? You mess around and help somebody. God knows how to turn around and help you on the back end. Now, you don't do something good to get something from God. You do it because he tells you to do it. And guess what? He said when you do it with no expectation, you're not doing it to get something from him. You just do it because you're being obedient. And guess what? When your time come around, God said, guess what? The same way you was able to help them with your limited resources, I can turn around and help you with my unlimited resources. And I believe there's some testimonies in here that can say, yes, Lord, I did the best I could to help my brother, my friend, a stranger, or whoever. And when I needed some help and couldn't nobody help me, there was a God that put one foot on the sea, one foot on the land, and gave me not just what I needed, but even gave me the desires of my heart. Tell me God won't do that for you. Because if you look around your house right now, there's a lot of stuff you didn't need, you just want it. And then God step in and give it to you. You don't need this and you may not need that. You don't need four bathrooms. You don't need five bedrooms. You just need a roof over your head. But God went on and gave you above what you even needed. He gave you what you asked for. Sometimes God will just give you the desires of your heart. So when he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, won't he do it sometimes? Bless the God that we serve. It said, blessed are the pure in heart, verse 8, yes. because they shall see God. Yes. Pure in heart. Pure just means clean. Yes. Heart that's unobstructed with the stuff and things of this world. Yes. There's some stuff that we harbor on our heart that we got to get rid of. Yes. There's some stuff that has stained our heart. Don't get me wrong now. It ain't always easy depending on what was done to you. But with the help of God, it can take place. That's why he said, blessed are the pure at heart. Some of the stuff that's on our heart, we got to learn how to let that stuff go. Listen, when I was in the Marines, we were in the field for over a week. When we finally made it back to the base, we were able to go ahead and huge showers. A few people could go in at one time. And I remember on this one occasion, in a hot climate in California, San Diego, the drain stopped up, stopped up in the shower. Yes. And you got grown men, I say grown men, 19, 20, 21, 22 year old, been out there rolling in the dirt for over a week. You can't imagine the stuff that should have been flushed down the drain, yes. but was still floating in the shower. Right. Now listen, that is what can happen in the heart sometimes. Right. When you don't learn how to let some stuff go. Well, you don't learn how to flush that stuff down. There's some stuff we got to learn how to let go of. There's some things we got to learn how to release and forgive. 
Because let me tell you something, forgiveness ain't always for the other person. Sometimes that forgiveness is for you. Sometimes that forgiveness is so you can have a clean heart. So you can have a good night's rest. Because you ain't always harboring junk on your heart that needs to be flushed away. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. When he says peacemakers, church, he means those that actively pursue peace. Not the people who go by and you know, what we used to call the drug dealer rules. I ain't see it. I don't know nothing about it. That's their business. I'm out of here. No, no, no. You can't stick your head in the sand. He said, you ought to be actively trying to bring peace. And one of the things you can do to bring peace is when you don't know something about somebody, keep your mouth closed. Talk back to me if you can. You can bring peace just by not allowing the junk to flow through you sometimes. You actively ought to be a peace maker. And he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Because that's a sign proof positive that they are the children of God. Now as we get to verse 10, right. in verse 10 he speaks generally. Yes. Then we get to verse 11. Then he speaks specifically. Okay. Then we get to verse 12. He said, now that's your real reward what you should be doing right there. So what does he say in verse 10? He starts it the same way he has all these other verses. Bless. He said, it may not feel like it. It may not seem like it. But it's actually a blessing. When who? Men. Well, does it just mean masculine? No, that means everybody. You are blessed when everybody or anybody, anybody, uh, excuse me, verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12. It says, All that live godly shall suffer persecution. Jesus says it this way in one of the gospels. He said, The world loves its own. So what am I saying? If you think you can live for the Lord and persecution does not come your way, you are fooling yourself. You can get into more awkward situations just doing what is right than you ever could running the streets and acting foolishly in the world. And Jesus said, when you do what I want you to do, when you live godly, and he said, you are blessed when you are persecuted, not for doing what is wrong, but when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, for doing what I tell you to do. I can't tell you the amount of times I've had to speak to somebody through plexiglass because they're in jail. And then they compare their plight to the plight of the Apostle Paul. Well, Paul was in jail, so I guess I got to be in jail too. Paul went through it. God blessed him. I guess God going to bless me too. Well, listen, Paul didn't get pulled over for driving no tags. Paul didn't go to jail because he was trying to hurt somebody or break some law. Paul went to jail because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you are blessed, you are blessed. When you live for the Lord and persecution comes your way. Yes. Now generally, that can take place of you live for the Lord. People know you're a Christian and they won't promote you because you have experience, you have the education, but they don't want somebody doing all that Christian stuff at the Christmas party. So we're not going to select this. You could be overlooked sometimes. It can even come that way. Don't send an email out and have the nerve to have some scripture at the bottom of it. Somebody going to say something about it. You are blessed when trouble comes your way for righteous sake. Listen now. There's a difference between suffering for yourself and suffering for the Savior. It's a difference between the two. And he says generally when you live for me, verse 14, 
and persecution happens to fall on you because it's going to happen. He said that is actually a blessing. Yeah. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They can get specific in verse number 11. Now we might as well just walk through this and then we can go home. You're blessed Amen. when men, that's everybody, mm -hmm. when they revile you, yes. when they persecute you in any form, yes. and when they start running their mouth, and they don't have anything legitimate or credible to say, mm -hmm. but they'll make stuff up. Amen. You know, folk that run their mouth don't care about the truth. Amen. They just care about spreading what they want people to hear. He said, when these things happen, and people talk about you for my sake, that is a blessing. Yes. What does it mean to revile? To revile means to slander somebody. Mm -hmm. To revile means to take somebody's name and run it through the dirt. Oh, you are blessed as a Christian when somebody, for whatever reason, is offended just by the way you live and the God that you serve. And guess what? They see God lighting a light in your life. And they want to get a damp rag and extinguish the flame. And what's the first thing people would do? Put their mouth on you. Let me tell you something now. Jesus here is telling us when God's got his hand on you, he take care of the people that got their mouth on you. You ain't got to worry about what folks are saying about you. Don't give what they say too much attention. Yeah. You see, a lie will get up and run around the world twice before the truth even got his shoes tied up on his feet. Yeah. Jesus said, you are blessed yeah. when men revile you. Yeah. You are blessed when men persecute you. Yeah. You are blessed when they start to make up stuff about you. Now, I want to put this in context. This, this don't mean that as a Christian, you don't stand up for yourself. Right. Now, now, now y'all stay with me. This don't mean that as a Christian, you just take any old thing. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some stuff the Lord wants you to take a stand on. There, there, there's some stuff he wants you to speak up on. The, the story is told about the preacher that they were having a tornado in the city. And he still had Bible study anyway. Yeah. And while they had a tornado warning and winds was gusting and the roof fell in on everybody. Well, there were some people that said, well, hey, I think what that preacher did was good. He maintained his faith. There were other folk that said, well, yeah, he did all right, but he should have maintained the roof. The point I'm trying to make is there are some people that can be so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. So don't, don't, don't read this the wrong way as if it is illegal in any way to defend your character or your credibility. He's just saying, when trouble comes your way, and you know you hadn't done nothing wrong, folk got to make up stuff to drag your name down. He said, baby, you are blessed. And he said, you know what you should be doing? Rejoicing, verse 12. And not just be glad, but be exceedingly great, glad. Because you got a reward that's on the way. And great is your reward. Notice what, the, what it says. Not on earth, but in heaven. Yes, sir. He said, listen, in the sweet by and by, first of all, he lets you know you're on your way to heaven. Yes. Next of all, he said, you have a great reward that's awaiting for you. He said, if you can hold on through the pressure, mm -hmm. if you can hold on through the pain, all right. if you can hold on through all that Satan has to throw at you, and I ain't going to give him too much credit because sometimes it ain't Satan, it's just other people. He said, but when they revile you, when they persecute you, when they get to the point to where they got to make up stuff about you for my name's sake, he said, that's a blessing. And that's when you really need to learn how to rejoice. Now, the first thing that happens is when you read the passage like that, the first thing people think of is who's been saying something bad about me. Yes. Instead of looking through the window, take time and look in the mirror. Yes. Who have you been saying something bad about? Let me tell you something right now. The hardest thing in the world 
is when you haven't done anything wrong and somebody tries to tear you down with their words. James chapter 3 talks about the tongue, the inconsistency of the tongue, the iniquity of the tongue. That little pink devil is set on fire of hell. And James says it this way, the tongue can no man tame. Listen, you can't control your own mouth well, let alone what somebody else going to say. But Jesus said, listen, if I got my hands on you, I can take care of the people that got their mouth on you. So all you do, don't, 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 don't you worry about that. Here's what you do in the face of all of that. You rejoice. You be exceedingly glad because great is your reward not on earth but in heaven now, as you read through this list the Sermon on the Mount these Beatitudes these attitudes that should be they don't seem like what the world would call a blessing being lied on talked about having to hold your tongue trying to do what's right with people that don't do what's right you, 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 these don't seem like blessings but listen what these things do is they push you if you want to be obedient to it to rely more and more on the Lord they push you to a point to where you're either going to do what God's word says or you're not going to do what God's word says and when you try to hold on with all of your might you find out that he's a friend to the friendless you find out that he will do just what he said that he would do. It don't always feel good, but what you feel got nothing to do with what the Bible says. He said, listen, you actually are blessed. Because what happens is, as a Christian, when you live obediently, and the world seems to notice that and close in around you, that's a confirmation to you of nothing else that this world is not your home. We are just pilgrims passing through. As Paul said in Philippians 3, our citizenship, he said conversation, but he said our citizenship is not on earth, but it's in heaven. We are only here for a short time. As Job said, what is your life but a vapor that appears for a moment and then will vanish away? What is your 80 years? Your 100 years. It's like the morning breath you probably saw this morning that showed up for a little while and then it was gone. This world is not our home. And many of you, as we close, you've taken your vacation or you traveled somewhere in the past, got you a nice hotel, hopefully it was comfortable and safe and had everything you needed. But I can guarantee you didn't none of you go in there hanging up pictures of your mom on the lawn. Then nobody go in there putting that rug in front of the toilet so your feet can be warm in the morning. You didn't change out the TV and get a bigger TV or a different TV. Go get some comforters from Kohl's and change out. No, you didn't do that. Why? Because you're only going to be there for a little while. So you didn't want to get too comfortable because this is just a space that you're in for a short time. The Bible is indicating to us as we have difficulties as we have these uncomfortable truths that we have to deal with, just remember this. Sometimes great is your reward in heaven. Don't get me wrong. Of course God doesn't just have to give you pie in the sky. I heard a preacher say this. Sometimes he can give me ham where I am. Yeah. He can't bless you right now. Don't get me wrong. But there's some stuff he said, listen, I may not give it to you right now, but if you trust me, if you lean not to your own understanding, if you acknowledge me in all of your ways, somebody here knows he will direct your path. Give God a hand clap of praise. We want to offer a to you this morning. Jesus lived. He died. And early that Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. Will you stand to your feet? He shed.